Isaiah is a prophet. Uh, He's speaking to God's people and he's calling them back to God, saying, please return to God, but God will provide you with salvation through the judgment of sins. And this is in the first half of that prophecy, Isaiah 11. Then a shoot will grow from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and strength, a spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight will be in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. He'll not execute justice by what he hears with his ears. But he will judge the poor righteously and execute justice for the oppressed of the land. He'll strike the land with a scepter from his mouth and he'll kill the wicked with a command from his lips. Righteousness will be a belt around his hips. Faithfulness will be a belt around his waist. The wolf will dwell with the lamb and the leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf, the young lion and the fattened calf will be together and a child will lead them. The cow and the bear will graze, their young ones will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like cattle. An infant will play beside the cobra's pit and a toddler will put his hand into a snake's den. They will not harm or destroy each other on my entire holy mountain for the land will be as full of the knowledge of the Lord as the sea is filled with water. On that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will look to him for guidance and his resting place will be glorious. On that day, the Lord will extend his hand a second time to recover the remnants of his people who survive from Assyria, Egypt, Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath and the coasts and islands of the west. He'll lift up a banner for the nations and gather the dispersed of Israel. He'll collect the scattered of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Ephraim's envy will cease. Judah's harassing will end. Ephraim will no longer be envious of Judah. Judah will not harass Ephraim, but they will swoop down on the Philistine flank to the west. Together they'll plunder the people of the east. They'll extend their power over Edom and Moab and the Ammonites will be their subjects. The Lord will divide the gulf of Suez. He'll wave his hand over the Euphrates with his mighty wind and will split it into seven streams, letting people walk through on foot. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will survive from Assyria as there was for Israel when they came up from the land of Egypt. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, if you open your newsletters, you'll find in there uh, a sermon outline on one side, uh, an outline or a copy of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Uh, We're one verse short there, but that's okay. And uh, there's some household questions up on the top right. We're going to sing that hymn in a moment. Uh, But what we're doing over the Advent series is looking at songs that we sing as God's people. Uh, Let me admit, the Bible studies aren't the easiest to digest, And uh, I understand that, uh, but please continue to think through what our songs mean as we look at God's Word. Uh, I was struck last night, I was at a party, and uh, someone struck up a a John Williamson song. Uh, I think it was Hey True Blue. Uh, I don't really know the lyrics, uh, but it was really interesting. By the end of the song, how many people were singing? Uh, There aren't many places in our community where you join together in singing, are there? Uh, Lots of people like to sing. Uh, I was struck by that last night as blokes who probably wouldn't sing at any other time were singing a song together uh, as they were gathered. We like singing. Uh, If you enjoy football, you'll be watching the World Cup at the moment, you'll see a lot of singing, won't you? Uh, Soccer fans or football fans seem to like it. Uh, International sporting events always start with a song, don't they? Uh, A national anthem. Every culture has one. Uh, To be part of a nation is to be part of a group identified by a song. Uh, Every time we gather together to have a birthday, we sing, don't we? And it's very rare for us to go through any day of the week without listening to a song. But let me tell you, there's no other group of people who are known as singing people like God's people. 
To be really blunt, God's people are a singing people. Let me say that again. God's people are a singing people. Uh, When God's people were saved from slavery in Egypt, when God brought them out with the plagues and as he took them through the Red Sea, what did they do on the other side of the Red Sea? They sang a song. They gathered together and they were led in a song by Moses and Miriam. Uh, God's people sing whenever they gather. That's why we've got a book in the middle of the Bible called God's Hymn Book, uh, the book of Psalms. That's why when you turn to a passage in the New Testament like Colossians 3, we are told, we're commanded, whenever you gather together, you should be singing. And when you get to the end of the Bible and you have that vision into all of eternity in Revelation 4 and 5, what are God's people doing? They're gathered before God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and they're singing. God's people are a singing people. Now, there are plenty of groups in our town that sing, but no other group sings as often as we do. No other group sings whenever they gather together like we do. No other community group contributes songs to our great festivals like we do. Think about Christmas and even Anzac Day, funerals. Even in movies like Ice Age, as I was listening to it this week, Christians have contributed songs that we can claim credit for. But here are a couple of questions for you. If someone said to you, tell me a definition for a song, what would you say? What do you have to have to have a song? And when we sing, what are we actually singing? They're really good questions at this time of the year because there are very few times, like Christmas, when our songs spill over into shopping malls and onto radio stations and into community events where everyone is gathered. What's a song? And why do we sing these things, especially at this time of year? Let me pray, and then we're going to look at that together. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thank you uh, for that marvellous image uh, of you as a singing God, a a God who is gathered with his singing people. I thank you for the way in which that's spilled over into our culture, Uh, from pages in The Lion, The Witch in the Wardrobe, the Narnia series, right through to the music we hear on radio and on song lists and in shopping malls, especially at this time. I thank you for the power of song, uh, for the way in which song stirs emotions and invites a response. Uh, Father, over the next four weeks as we look at songs that your people have put together, uh, please stir our emotions rightly and call a response from us that acknowledges the goodness that you have showered upon your people and upon this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Well, I want to have just a quick break at the moment. Uh, I want you to spend uh, 60 seconds with the person next to you talking about what you need to have to have a song. Come up with a definition for a song. If you've already read the bulletin blurb, you'll be streets ahead. But I want you to just take 60 seconds to chat with someone next to you about what a song is. Go for it. Well, there you go. That's got the grey matter ticking over. It's not a question you're asked very often, is it? Uh, How do you define a song? If technology works, I'll see if I can get this working. Uh, Here's my definition for a song come up with on a very early morning run, so there's not much effort put into it. Uh, Truth to music, to stir emotion and to invite a response. Truth to music, to stir emotions and to invite a response. I'm sure you could quibble with that. Uh, That's a good thing uh, if you don't always agree with what I say and others might suggest that we've actually gone too far. You don't really want to overthink these things, do you? You just want to sing a song, and I can understand that too. Uh, But each week we sing three songs. Once a month we sing four. 
And at this time of the year, there's a whole subgenre of our music, Christmas carols, that the rest of our community is at least aware of. That spill over from our gatherings into the world around us. And so it's worth thinking about what a song is because they actually take up a lot of our time, our listening time, our speaking time, our gathering time. Why are they so influential? Why are we a singing people? Now, when you look at that definition, there are four parts to it. Uh, There's truth. There's truth. A song must have truth in it. Now, our world might differ with us about a definition of truth, but a song has truth. Uh, that truth, secondly, is set to music. Uh, I'm hopeless musically. Uh, I can harm a little bit. I, I like to sing, but it's a joyful noise. Uh, but music actually works, doesn't it? Uh, there are people incredibly talented who can put these little things on a page, on bars, and somehow they come out, and it just sounds magnificent, doesn't it? Truth, music, to stir emotions. That's the first aim of a song, to stir your feelings and your emotions. Emotions aren't evil. They're not wrong. They're not something Christians should get rid of. They're there in the fruit of the Spirit. They're there right throughout the Bible. Uh, They're part of how God has made us. They're part of who we are. They're legitimate. And secondly, to invite a response. The emotions are there. The truth is there. The music is there. And it says, How are you going to respond to this? And the response might actually be the emotion itself. Over the next few weeks, and you'll see there on your preaching postcard, we're going to look at four Christmas carols. And we're going to see how they work, what they say, what they do. Uh, The first is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and you've got it there in your service sheet on that A5 sheet. Uh, It it seems to have emerged uh, in the 15th century, Uh, That's at least when we can track the music to. Uh, The lyrics we've got today are translated from a Latin hymn in 1851, a traditional hymn that was structured in a way to emphasise wisdom. It's probably the least familiar of our Christmas carols. And let me tell you, it has the most Bible whacked into the least number of words you could find. Uh, It is so dense theologically. Uh, Five verses... Two-line chorus, and let me tell you, I think this summarises the whole Bible, Genesis to Revelation, in those five verses and two lines of the chorus. Every phrase seems to have its roots in God's word. Uh, What I want to do now under the second point on your outline, truth, is to just unpack some of that together using some of the words that we've got from the carol itself. Uh, you'll see it there on the outline and you'll be able to follow along using that, uh, that print. And I'll have the key Bible verses up on the overhead. So you can just concentrate on what we're doing together. Right from the start, the song is sad. Right from the start, the song is sad. There's a people who are captive. No one likes captivity. No one likes having someone who has taken control of them. That people is Israel. We'll get to them in a moment. And their captivity is described in a number of ways. If you look at the song, they're in lonely exile. I don't know if anyone here has been taken into forced captivity, taken away from your land and your home, removed from everything that is yours, and placed in loneliness. Uh, That people has a violent ruler now. They suffer under Satan's tyranny. The devil rules them. They're opposed to God. The captivity of those people is described as the depths of hell and the grave. They're under the judgment of God and their lives end in death. In fact, all of their life is lived under the dark shadow of death. The colour of their lives is the gloomy clouds of night. And in summary, right there at the end, without anything else in this song, they are a people who live in misery. 
That's the way to capture people's attention with a song, isn't it? But it's not just Israel or a particular group that's like this. It's actually a description of all humanity. Listen to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Together they've become useless. There's no one who does good, not even one. This is the human problem, isn't it? Every human is opposed to God. Every human is set against God by their nature. We are sinners. We think we can be God instead of God. Uh, And let me assure you, at moments when we are sober and reflective, we know that we live under death's dark shadow, don't we? We know that the colour of our lives is often the gloomy clouds of night and we're exiled from the one who made us. Israel is thy tribes. Uh, It talks about that in the first verse and the second verse. Uh, It's a nation that God has gone, I'm going to be committed to you, Mom. Uh, You are my people. Uh, God doesn't do that just because he likes that group, likes the name, likes the way it rolls off his tongue. No, no, God does that because of who he is. Remember Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. The Lord said to Abram, go out from your land, your relatives, your father's house to the land that I'll show you. I'll make you into a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. You'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who treat you with contempt. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Humans have turned their back on God. God's given them what they want in judgment. You can have life without me and life without God is death. And at the very moment humans turn away from God, what does God do? God doesn't turn away from them. God commits to them. God reaches out. He grabs a bloke called Abram and says, Hey, Abram, listen to me. I'm committed through your family, your community, to restore this broken world and to bind up all those who are damaged. God made a promise. God keeps that promise. And that's why we've been spending so long in the book of Genesis. How, why we're spending uh, eight years looking at the promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. And then uh, Jacob has how many boys? He has 12 boys. And those 12 boys become 12 tribes that are given the name of Israel, God's mom. The people of God that God saved. And God's given them a job. Represent me to the world, Exodus 19, 1 to 8. That's the law at Sinai that God gave them, described there in the second verse. So we've got a problem and now we've got a promise. Through that mob, God's mob, God is going to deal with the human problem. The problem, sin, the promise, Abraham's family. How's it going to take place? Well, you know what it's like when you've got a captive. You've got to set them free, don't you? You've got to set them free. And, and setting anything free is going to come at a price. It's going to cost. It's going to take a ransom. Did you see that there in the first verse? A ransom so that captive Israel can go free, so the humans can go free. And you'll notice in the first verse there that it's connected with someone appearing. Who's that? It's the Son of God. Uh, In the third verse, the identity of this Son of God is connected to a particular part of Abraham's family. It's a family of a bloke called Jesse. Now, I've not met a Jesse in Narrabri, but I know where this Jesse lived. He lived near a town called Bethlehem. He had a number of boys, and his youngest boy was a boy named... David, and David became the greatest king in the history of Abraham's family. God made him a promise. 2 Samuel chapter 7, go and look it up later on. We're not going to look at it now. But God said to David, hey, David, there's going to be a bloke in your family tree and he's going to be the greatest king of all. 
He's actually going to be part of my plan to restore the whole world. Uh, In fact, I'm going to call him my boy. And as his father, I will punish him on behalf of the people he ruled. In fact, that punishment is described as a ransom that will set people free in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 5 to 6, but he was pierced because of our transgressions, crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace was on him and we're healed by his wounds. We all went astray like sheep. We all turned to our own way. And the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. Did you hear the ransom language there? We're set free. We're healed. He cops it, so we walk out. A man stands in for people like us. He dies for our sins. He dies so that people like you and me who are captive, who dwell under death's dark shadow, people like us can be set free. That man is from the family of Abraham. That man is in the line of kings from God's people. That man will die for humans and set them free. That man is the son of God. That man has a nickname. That nickname is Emmanuel. And I love a song that tells me the ending in the first line because that's what this song does, doesn't it? Do you see what it does there in the first line? It introduces us to the nickname straight up. Emmanuel, that's who we want to have come. It's a name that God introduced first in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 7, and he said to his people, there'll be a day, one day, when I'm going to come and hang out with you so you'll be free. That name only really reappears in the first chapter of the New Testament when we have this account, which we heard Steve read earlier on. She will give, that's Mary, give birth to a son. You ought to name him Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. There's that ransom language. Now, all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. See, the virgin will become pregnant, give birth to a son, and they'll name him Emmanuel, which is God with us. If you were listening closely to what Steve read from Matthew 1, 18 to 25, you would have heard that Jesus' earthly father is from which family? David's family. You would have heard that they're going to be in a town connected with Jesse, which is Bethlehem. There was going to be a son. He was to be born to save people from their sins. He'll be called Jesus or Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And so we've got a summary of the whole song in one nickname. I don't know if we grasp how big this is. We get excited about family coming for Christmas, and rightly so. We get excited when our local MP comes to town, and rightly so. Do we get excited when the one who is our mortal enemy, whom we have rebelled against and thumbed our noses at, do we get excited when he comes and hangs out with us? When God himself puts on flesh and says, I'm going to go and live with those who hate me, who have rebelled against me, who deserve my judgment, because that's what God does in Jesus. That's our great hope, when the one we sin against actually comes and says, I'm going to set you free. That man is Jesus. His nickname is Emmanuel, and that is the promise of God fulfilled. And you see how in the first line of each verse, we're given another version of that nickname, just to remind us of how important it is. Emmanuel is thou Lord of might, the one who has so much power that he uses it for the good of his enemies to forgive them. Emmanuel is thy rod of Jesse, uh, part of the family tree of Jesse, but also a means of judging our sin. Emmanuel is thou dayspring, 
a fount of living water that restores broken and dead people. That brings light, as we heard in Isaiah 9, to those living in darkness. Emmanuel is our key of David, an unlocking of the right kind of kingship that our world desperately needs. And all of those truths, all of those truths lead to a glorious future, don't they? Dwelling in our heavenly home. Dwelling in our heavenly home. Jesus actually describes it as uh, he's the builder. Uh, He's the one who opens the door for us. And he's the one who'll come and take us to be with him. He describes it to his disciples like this. Jesus told him, Thomas, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Have you thought of that? Jesus is the bloke who'll be both the builder and the butler. He'll make your house and get it ready for you. And then he'll come and take you to be with him. And what kind of house is it? It's the most magnificent house you could ever imagine. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with men. He'll live with them. They'll be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will exist no longer. Grief, crying and pain will exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. Death's dark shadow, gone. Tyranny of Satan, not in God's house. Misery, no more tears. Captivity, you have freedom to go into any room of the house. Five truths and a summary of the whole storyline of the Bible. One nickname, Emmanuel, all summed up in Jesus. There are the truths. What are the emotions? You'll see some suggestive ones there on your outline. These are the emotions of Bernard. They're my suggestions. You might have other emotions, especially as we sing the song. The first, I think, is an emotion of longing or lament or even despair. Do you see how each of the lines starts? O come, O come. Have you ever yearned for a day to come because, you know, on that day, something amazing will happen. Each of the verses begins reminding us that I'm a singer that is broken and I desperately need to be put right. Someone needs to step in because I'm so damaged. I'm so all over the place. It's an emotion of mourning, an emotion of consolation. Uh, It's actually an emotion that Jesus brings out in his first discussion group with his disciples. Blessed are those who mourn. Uh, When Jesus rocks up at the temple as an eight-day-old, Simeon grabs him, an old man who'd been waiting in that temple for the consolation of Israel. Simeon grabs him and goes, this is the one. In Jesus, there is consolation. There is salvation. There is binding up in the flesh achieved. Uh, That spills into the second emotion. I don't know whether sobriety is an emotion. I'm going to call it one at the moment. But it's actually looking out at the world with eyes that are both clear and crying. Clear and crying. It looks at a world that's broken. It recognises the truth that we are all sinners It looks out and sees a shadow of death everywhere we look. It recognises that left to our own devices, we're headed for the depths of hell. It recognises misery and gloominess and it cries out for help. O come, O come. The third emotion is that of rejoicing. It seems a strange one, doesn't it? Rejoice, 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 because those two emotions have been answered, those first two, that crying out and that sobriety. It's the rejoicing because there is someone who will make you whole again. There is someone who will bust you out of captivity. There is someone who will change the palette of your day from gloomy darkness to everlasting light. 
There is someone who will deal with your greatest problem. And that problem isn't poverty. That problem isn't pain. That problem isn't your suffering. That problem is your sin. The cause of all of those things. And so people who know Jesus can rejoice and look forward to a day when there is a heavenly home welcomed and the butler and the builder is Emmanuel and he says, come home. I've got your bed ready and the table is set. Which leads to the fourth emotion, the emotion of desire. The emotion that expresses the deepest hope and expectation that you can have. Please come back, Jesus. Please come back today. Please come back and bind me up so that I can see the goodness of my heavenly home. Five truths, four emotions combined in a song to invite a response. So I want to give you 60 seconds to think about your response. You might do it chatting with the person next to you. You might do it just writing down a couple of ideas. And then I'll close with four simple questions. Let me ask you four questions. Do you lament the state of our broken world, our hobbling lives, and our captivity to our own rebellion against God? Do you look at and live in this world with a clear and crying sobriety? Have you met Jesus, who is God with us, who promises to remove death's dark shadow and bring the greatest joy. What is your greatest, your deepest, and your most all-consuming desire? Let me pray. Father, thank you for songs. Thank you for people who are good at music and words. I thank you for our history that throws up so many good songs. Father, thank you for Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you for your promise to deal with our human problem. And thank you for opening up a heavenly home through him. Father, please call in us the emotions and response that hear this truth rightly and know the goodness of your consolation and forgiveness. Amen.